Wow, welcome. Looks like we're live. My name is Mike Crawford. I am the host of The Young Jerks. We are definitely live. I'm watching ourselves on uh, the Facebook live feed. Uh, again, my name is Mike Crawford. I am the host of The Young Jerks. You may have seen me on Channel 5 last night, WCVB. Uh, some of my friends and family and neighbors definitely did see it, uh, getting some phone calls and texts and messages. Uh, you might also see our social media because we're giving away free cannabis at Boston Calling. Big deal going on. Pretty funny that we get all the headlines for this, but uh, we'll be talking about that today, definitely. My name, again, is Mike Crawford. I am a very bad boy. <laughs> very bad boy wanting to give away cannabis at Boston Calling, apparently. But uh, we'll talk about that and much more. Uh, we'll take your phone calls, 502-501-3477. I don't even have it written down writing it down right now just so i don't forget it but I, I i that proves murphy after how many months i finally figured out the phone number here 502-501-3477 is our telephone line you can also leave us instant feedback um i know there's a lot of places to watch us but usually i check the instant feedback on the young jerks uh facebook so best place to leave it but you can also do it on disrupt boss and i'm sure murphy will check it out and let us know uh or on youtube or any of the other places we're at uh, we have a special guest here, so I'm going to get right to it. Uh, we have returning, and I'm not sure if last time he was actually the mayor. I wasn't. Okay, he was a city councilor, and he's been here, uh, I think, a couple times, two or three times maybe. Yeah, two, I think. Two, okay. Yeah. So this will be your third time yeah. on the Young Jerk Show. Different location now. Uh, we're at Dig today at Dig Boston headquarters. Um, but we're with the mayor, the now Cambridge mayor of Boston. Um, I'm saying mayor of Boston. <laughs> I say his name so much, Marty Walsh, mayor of Boston. But no, we're with I'm the other mayor. I'm a little shorter than Marty. <laughs> you are? <laughs> yeah, I am. I thought, okay. Uh, we're with the other mayor across the river uh, in Cambridge where I used to live, the city of Cambridge. I think it's the better place to live, honestly. Nothing against Boston. I just love Cambridge. Uh, but we're with mayor uh, of Cambridge, uh, Mark McGovern. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Do you disagree? Do you think Boston is better, uh, or or Cambridge, oh. or you don't want to step in that? No, I'll step in it. Cam Cambridge is far better. You, you're not <laughs> shy to say that. You <laughs> should say that. Being the mayor of Cambridge, yeah, right? It was it was funny. We were up in uh, I was up in Montreal with Mayor Walsh looking at safe injection sites. As which we, may, right. we, we may get to that. Um, and one of the interesting things about Montreal, which I didn't know, was Montreal was a lot you, about 20 years ago was a lot like Metro Boston. Montreal proper was about 700,000 people, and then you had all these cities suburbs, around it. Suburban cities. And 20 years ago, they voted to all sort of be taken over by Montreal. Oh, really? And so I told I told Mayor Walsh, I said, you know, any time Boston wants to become part of Cambridge, we'd be more than happy to <laughs> entertain that. But it didn't go over so well. <laughs> he said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he answered me actually. <laughs> Um, so yeah, speaking of uh, you went to Montreal, I, I think that's a good jumping point. I'd like to get into that because uh, you went with Mayor Walsh up to Montreal to look at safe injection sites. It's something we've been asking pretty much every candidate that's come through. Uh, a lot of the city council candidates seem to support it. Ricardo Arroyo, running for Boston City Council, definitely supports it. Uh, a lot of the candidates support this. Where are you on this, and uh, what was your experience there with Mayor Walsh? Yeah, so um, Mayor Walsh and I were both appointed to the state's harm reduction commission, and uh, we actually we went up there. We, it was two separate trips. We just happened to overlap in Montreal. Um, I'm completely supportive of it, uh, of safe injection sites. I, I'm a social worker is my background. I have worked uh, for a long time with uh, you know, families uh, that have been impacted by uh, the heroin epidemic uh, and drugs in general. Um, and, you know, the thing that I keep coming back to when we talk about this is that uh, there have been, there's about 100 safe injection sites around the world, and there have been zero deaths right. in any site. Um, and, you know, you it's one, like anything, whether it's housing or whether it's, uh, substance use disorder or what have you, it, these are complicated problems that need multiple pieces to solve them. And harm reduction is one of those pieces. Treatment is one of those pieces. Education is one of those pieces. Going after the pharmaceutical companies that are driving this is one of those pieces. Um, but you know, we, it, the research shows that people are three times more likely to get into treatment through a safe injection site, uh, and they don't die. That's awesome. You know, that's, and a, that's a number that people should look at. Three times more likely. Yeah. Isn't that what we want? We want to get addicts into treatment. So if 
that's the case, I mean, I don't know how you could look at it any other way. Yeah, I mean, what was what was really um, amazing to me was just how far ahead Canada is with understanding that substance use disorder is an illness. It's not a crime, you know. It's not, um, you know, it, it, this isn't. It, People aren't willingly going into this. I, I'll do a little, can I do a little interactive uh, game with your audience? Sure. Okay. So for anyone who's watching this at home, I want you to raise your hand if you've ever asked a child what they want to be when they grow up. <laughs> now raise your hand if any of those chi children ever sent an addict. Yeah, I don't think anyone ever I don't think that. anyone ever raises their hand. And, you know, we are so far behind in looking at whether it's homeless people whether it's people struggling with addiction, rem remembering that these they were kids once. They're somebody's child. They're somebody's brother. They're somebody's husband, wife, you know, what have you. Um, and we're just, you know, we just have to be more compassionate, and we have to understand this as an illness uh, and not a, a, a crime. Why do you think uh, Americans or America, the United States, is different than Canada in that? Why, wh like, what's the difference? Why are we behind? Yeah, I mean, well, so Canada has, so about 20 years ago, Vancouver opened the first, their first safe, safe consumption injection. site, right? Yep. Safe injection site. And it kind of, you know, the federal government in Canada came in and said, you know, this is illegal, you can't do it. Uh, it kind of went through the court system. It took, you know, 20 years about uh, to get through the court system until the Supreme Court of Canada said you, you could. So they've been having this discussion a lot longer than we have, right? So that's one thing. Um, but, you know, I think it falls into that whole, you know, it's that American bravado, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps right. kind of macho attitude that this, you know, so many people in this country. I can't hear a hold. lot of times people say it's a choice. Right. Which right. to me, it's just like, really, you think someone chooses to be, I don't know. I, 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 I find that hard to believe. And especially knowing how easy it is to slip down that like I, I feel very lucky I didn't when I hurt my back and the, the pills I was prescribed I think the only reason I didn't get hooked on them is because uh, they made me sick to my stomach mm. and I just did not like the feel of them and yep. I just immediately said no nah, I'm throwing these out yep. you know um, yep. just about them uh, they made me feel good I probably would have got hooked yeah well I mean that's I mean that's the major that's the vast majority of people who are using heroin get it through they start through prescription medication um, and then you have the pharmaceutical companies that are, you know, pushing that onto doctors. You have doctors that are overprescribing. Um, you know, it's not the, you know, these aren't the drug dealers in dark alleys that get people sure. hooked. These are your, this is your doctors. your doctor. And yeah. it's athletes. It's, it's, it's yep. uh, you know, where I come from, the culture I come from, which I still definitely, uh, you know, feel like I'm a part of is an athlete. Like I, I see so many athletes. We have all, like, especially when you get older, you know, the knees, the back, the shoulders, so many issues that we have. And so many of us are now hooked on pills. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm all about the cannabis issue. Mm -hmm. If it works for you, uh, sometimes it doesn't work and you still need to, you know, use something extra. But there are other ways, yep. and not just cannabis, too. We talk about other things like, you know, nutrition, diet, uh, exercise, which are huge for me. Um, you know, herbs are great. I, I look at uh, turmeric. I don't know if people know about turmeric, but you should check that out if you're in pain. It's great anti-inflammatory. It's an Indian food. There are other things, too, like cannabis and THC and CBD that we talk about a lot on this show. There are a lot of other things. Uh, we'll take the phone call, 502-501-3477. We're speaking to the mayor of Cambridge, Mark, Mc Mark McGovern. Who's on the telephone line? Robert. Robert, what's up? Uh, I just want to talk about the issue that's come up with the opiate addiction, and my wife works in oncology, and as a result of the opiate addiction issue, her patients are having trouble getting actual needed Pills. medicine. Right. Yeah, I mean, that is that is one, um, I, we've heard that before, and that is certainly one thing that, that has to be addressed. Um, you know, I think some of it has to do with uh, you know the the uh, the number of pills that get prescribed. Um, you know it, it it's not a simple answer, right? And so yeah, you have people who legitimately need opioids to manage their pain, um, and you know and those people need to be taken care of, and 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 certainly um, should get the medication that that they need. 
I do think, as like as you just said, I think you know exploring alternatives too are, are you know are important. And acupuncture. I mean, I could keep going, but uh, l- let me ask you. You're on the phone. Uh, your name again was Robert. Right, yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to bring up the fact that kind of what my wife has seen. That's what I want to ask you. Are you insurance you're, providers. Is your wife uh, someone who's on opiates or needs them, or, or are you talking about other no, people? No, she's an oncology nurse. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. So what kind so of? She sees people who literally need opiates. I mean, opi- the, the thing about opiates is they're very effective. And, w- and when you say uh, oncology, tell us like the type of people, like their conditions. I want to know like what people want to hear that. Like what what, uh, what kind right of people? Right now, she's seeing? in. Breast cancer and gynecological cancer. Okay. She's been in uh, pediatric neuro onc, though. Uh, she's actually bone marrow transplant. You know, she's done a lot of it. And what she's noticed in her experience is that we're kind of like swinging back to a very restrictive mm-hmm. mode. And that's a problem. You too. know, where where the problem? Yeah, I mean, and I'm not saying this is necessarily an easy thing to solve. But we also have to be aware that there are people who are like terminal cancer Definitely. patients who, well, one of the, you know, if they get addicted to her- addicted to opiates, it's not going to be an they're issue. They're going to die anyways. Well, right. one, one, of, yeah. one, of, one of the one of the things is that uh, here's a, here's a difference: is if if you're someone who you know has cancer and you are on opioids long term and you keep getting prescribed opioids because it's your your condition, um, that's one thing. But what what the people who tend to get hooked on heroin from opioids is they get a they tend to get a prescription with sort of a large number of pills and then that prescription ends and, and then no they don't get another prescription and so they're at that point it's i think they say it's about seven days you need to to potentially become addicted at that point they turn to, to street, street drugs and heroin where someone who yeah. has cancer who's being monitored by a doctor who's getting ongoing prescriptions that's that's different so um, well, and unfortunately, the insurance companies are not treating it that way. So what she's noticed, because she has to deal with insurance companies in her job, is that they are very reluctant to approve opiates mm-hmm. to people who do need it because, I mean, let me put it this way. I feel like there's kind of, and this is a very American thing, is we tend to deal things in, deal with things in very blunt ways. You know, it's... It's like, oh no, we need to do entire. We need to criminalize this, and we need to do this. And what's lost is the subtlety of science and medicine, mm-hmm. which is that there's some people who need it, and other people who probably don't need it as much, you know. And instead, what she's saying is, because of course the government's like shouting at these companies, is that. You know, they're more likely to turn down stuff. I mean, she's had terminal patients turn down for opiates, and I'm like thinking in my head, like, okay, if you're terminal, addiction is not an issue. Right. Just to be blunt about it, you know? Right. Uh, palliative care is the issue, making you comfortable, making you as functional as you can to the end is the issue. Right. You and, know? Well, and I don't, I think that's not getting noticed. Definitely. Um, I, I, I've heard this call before, and uh, I definitely feel feel that and i just wonder what's the solution do you do you, does your wife or you have any kind of like how do we prevent people from getting addicted to opiates from doctors but how do we not shut people out who really need it well her the talks i've had with her it usually involves around being a little more uh invested in what the patient has and kind of analyzing it like that and you know there i know that becomes problematic because there are a lot of people who will say oh i've got back pain you know and, and how a lot do of you people really do have it too though pain? yeah and I, you well know, yeah that's the thing a lot of people, fake people it, who but, need yeah. it for back pain but how do you diagnose how do you diagnose back it's pain the back only pain way to diagnose to, back yeah. pain is talking to someone yeah. and you don't know the veracity of their statement so you know, as opposed to people who have, like, you know, oh, my God, we found this tumor. Um, so I think there needs to be uh, some work on that. I think, to be honest, we have a federal government with a lot of money, and they should be, like, spending billions in the, in the you know, uh, area of, like, how do we determine that? Like, this is not a question I think we can answer yet, but I think it's a question we need to solve. 
Yeah, it's definitely part of uh, an important part of the conversation for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Robert, for calling. All right. Thank you. Excellent. I think that was a first-time caller. I should have asked him. 502-501-3477 is our phone number. We're the Young Jerks. We're here live Saturdays at 6 p.m. You can also follow us on Twitter, at the Young Jerks. Uh, you're probably watching us on our Facebook, but you can also find us there. Uh, we've got uh, a bunch of podcast places we're at, too, whether it's Stitcher, iTunes, you know, all the usual places. Subscribe to us. Like us. Give us a rating on our iTunes on uh, Apple. That helps us as well if you like us. Um, we're the Young Jerks. And again, uh, we're speaking to Mayor of Cambridge, Cambridge Mayor Mark McGovern. Uh, we got a lot of questions. People are already asking you yeah, questions. Great, bring it. We want to get to uh, a lot of different things. But first thing, and we had you here after last week. There was uh, kind of a little, little controversial, a little heat last week. A lot of people were uh, talking about this. Uh, we had uh, Ben Simon come in, who was running for Cambridge City Council, mm -hmm. and he kind of indicated some things about. Uh, contributions that you had uh, received some of it was true and some of it wasn't um, do you want to talk about that acknowledge it or just get it out there sure I mean the only thing I would say I mean this was what he was talking about was around the EMF building and um, you know I assume I don't know if, if we need to explain what that was about but it's a it was a low rent artist space building in it's where our studio used to yeah, be that's as right. well that's right, that's right. that's right that's right that's the first time so I was we, we you know and basically um, a uh, developer came in, bought the building, right. and displaced everyone because right. you know rents are, rents are going up, and you can get more money. And we we were part of that. We got displaced as well. Yeah. So um, one of the things that Ben had said on the on the show, which is why so I contacted you to kind of set the record straight, was the developer uh, is John D. Giovanni, and Ben had said that I am taking contributions from him, uh, and I and I was taking contributions from him even after the EMF. Fiasco, fiasco. Uh, and the reality is, I haven't taken money from John D. Giovanni since 2016, long before I was aware of anything going on with the EMF building. So I just wanted to set the record straight on that. Um, you know, in that regarding that building, you know, in general, I, you know, I feel terrible that that building was lost. Um, you know, not only was it, uh, uh, you know, affordable space for people right which is at a premium and there's not enough of it um it was really a community right Definitely. and 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 so i you know i feel terrible that that happened um when i became aware of it you know the you know the city can't stop a private real estate transaction you know um and when we became aware of it thanks to the advocacy of the emf uh, community you know i tried to address it i i had several meetings with D. giovanni um, I had several meetings with the EMF tenants. I even brought, at the request of the EMF tenants, brought D. Giovanni in to meet with them so that they could try to explain to him how important this space was. Um, I got D. Giovanni to agree to lease the building to the city if the city was willing to lease it to keep it as artist space. And I got the city manager, inspectional services, the fire department, all out there to inspect the building and see if the city wanted to invest in it. Um, the city manager said no. Um, that's his call un under our charter. Um, but I tried to get the building leased by the city to keep it as our space. Now, let me ask you that, because the city manager can overrule you on that completely, well, or he, it just, he has like kind of a, a big say because he's the city manager. So, so the city charter in Cambridge is different than, so we have a, a strong city manager, weak mayor, okay. form of government. Okay. So we can't, the, the, city, the, the city council sets policy, approves the budget, you know, we, we deal with ordinances, zoning, things like that. But the the expenditure has to first come from the city manager. So the city manager would say, if the city manager wanted to invest in the building, he would he would say, okay, I want to do this. And then he would send a request to the city council for an appropriation of so whatever. Much, five million, yeah, whatever. What, what, whatever. And then the city council would approve that appropriation. But if that, appropri if that request for that appropriation never comes, we can't. Do it. Wow, that's crazy. So, we so he runs the show on that. I mean, he's he's he, the Congress of the city council. He, you know, we you know, so we can have, you know, the city council can pass a policy order nine to nothing, saying we want the city to spend X number of dollars on whatever, right. and the city manager can come back and say I'm not. He's not spend budgeting, it. Yeah. right? And mm -hmm. you know, it, it cuts both ways. I mean, it's it's in some ways is problematic because we are the elected. That's what I was going to ask. Body. The city manager isn't elected. No, right? he's, who he's decides it? You guys the hire him? Yeah, okay, the council. council. So, 
So on one hand, it's you know it's problematic in some ways because we're the elected body and well, you're, and you're taking the heat for it too. I we're think taking that's, the a, heat. that's not fair. Right. Um, um, but, I'm but, glad but we the, brought that up. But the, I want to ask you okay, some other questions related to this because uh, you know number one, I want to make a note too. You did uh, you know there were some things concessions made to uh, the tenants, and I feel like they would never happen if it wasn't for you. Where they got to stay longer. Yeah. So so that was you know so this is the thing that. Um, you know, beyond, I, I get that I didn't get the ball over the finish line, and I feel terrible about that. I really do. I, I wish we had been able to save the building. Um, but I could only do so much. And, you know, we did it, get extended time for the tenants. I, D. Giovanni agreed to, to provide money for some moving expenses. For There were the, the um, a couple of the tenants were producers, and they had a lot of really expensive equipment. It wasn't just sort of picking up your guitar or sure. whatever, right? So I got D. Giovanni to agree to pay for that. Um, you know, and I get that that's not enough. It, it's it's a drop in the bucket when you lose your community. But I, you know, this, I'm a little confused as to why I became public enemy number one sure. in this because the reality is no other council well, there was able to do. To. I mean, you know? I think what the, the part that people get upset for, you know, about is what Ben Simon brought up. And it's also a lot of our criticism, you know, on this show for like Mayor Walsh and a lot of the other politicians that are good on a lot of issues. Like Mayor Walsh, I agree with on so much, mm -hmm. but there are certain issues like the developers. You know, it's it sometimes seems like, and I'm not saying this about you. I'm not mm -hmm. picking anyone else. I, I feel like I can say it about Mayor Walsh because Boston is so different. It seems like the mayors are always developer. They're they're it's like a slush fund for them for crying out loud. I mean, mm -hmm. I watch like six figure uh checks go in against cannabis you know the anti uh, uh, they were against legalization campaign the safe mm -hmm. and healthy they got like hundred thousand dollar contributions from where boston developers who were trying to win favor with mayor walsh and they also had a uh, building that wasn't environmentally uh, there's a lot of backstory mm -hmm. to this stuff but mm -hmm. um with you though you know and with even ben simon's you know comments were that no city council should be taking developer money mm -hmm. w what would you say to that well let me ever yeah i know you, i know yeah, that you're not taking I, D. giovanni's uh, money right. now and, and i and i really i've as of a couple of years ago have really stopped you know doing that um but let me say this just categorically i've lived in cambridge my whole life my family's been in cambridge 100 years going back to my great grandfather who used to feed he had a small grocery store italian immigrant you know didn't speak the language, came here at 17, typical immigrant story, able to, you know, buy into a small grocery store in the North End, feeding people in the neighborhood during the Depression. My grandmother, who started the Riverside Neighborhood Association, my mother, who started the Cambridge Women's Commission. And I love this city, and I would never and have never changed a vote because of a campaign contribution. If I have it my way, I'm going to die in my great-grandfather's chair in the living room that my family's lived in for 100 years, and they're going to carry me out feet first. And I would never do something that I think is bad for the city because somebody wrote me a $500 check. Are you, and I, and are I you just, saying that you'd stop taking developer money going forward? Or would you kind of make, try to make that pledge? Well, I haven't. For the last couple of years, I haven't been taking developer money. That's good to know. Okay. Um, but I'll say this, that you know, people donate money to campaigns because they the person that they want to see elected supports you know their whatever it is right um, I, I get money from teachers i get money from social workers right um i'm sure you get money from cannabis supporters i, I, I do us. i do i and mean that's what i would give you money for I, if, I, I, if i'm yeah. writing a check right and and you know the thing you have to i think there's there's two things you know one thing you have to look at is has the elected official changed their position because of the money right so I'm not anti-development. You know, when I look back at Kendall Square, what Kendall Square was like when I was growing up, I am very glad Kendall Square looks the way it does today than it did when I was a kid. And you know why? Because Cambridge was broke, our schools were crumbling, our infrastructure was crumbling. Do you like the bike lanes we're doing in Cambridge? Yeah, it looks yeah, nice. Yeah, never would have happened in the 70s because we had no money. Um, f we're rebuilding three schools at half a billion dollars uh, with no state money and no increase in property taxes. Why? Because Kendall Square looks the way it does. Um, you know, so I'm glad that we have the revenue stream that we have because we can do things that no other city can do and we're doing it. Now, as far as the, you know, the, the money goes, um, my motto has been, I want developers to scream but not run away. 
I want to squeeze them for every single community benefit we can possibly get. But at the end of the day, I want to work towards a yes because I would rather that development happen in Cambridge than somewhere else. And so let me just give you a quick example. You know the Mass and Main building up on Mass yes, Ave that's being yes. built? Okay. So when they came forward, they, they were asking for 11 stories higher than what current zoning that's at right. the time allowed. Yes. And at the time, our inclusionary zoning percentage, which is the amount of housing that a developer has to turn over to the city, was 11.5%. So they came in and they said, well, we'll do the 11.5%. Hmm. And I said, absolutely not. I want 20, which was, there was never a 20% project in the city at that point. So then they came back at 14%. It's better than 11 and a half, but it's not 20. Then they came back at 16. Then they came back at 17.5. And when they got to 20, I was a person of my word and I agreed to support the project. Going from 11 and a half percent to 20 cost that developer about $40 million. Do you think he's happy with me? I wouldn't think so. No. No. Now, if I was someone who was, you know, in the pocket of developers, I would have settled at 14% and said, oh, look, I got a little bit more. But I didn't. I pushed them to the absolute max that could have, that, that we could get. And I, I did that with Boston Properties, where we got to 25% affordable housing. And I was the le leader with Councillor Simmons to make 20% mandatory across the city. So, you know, I'm, I am not someone who gives in to developers by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm someone who's willing to work with them. But as long as they do what I think is acceptable for the city, I will support the project. If they don't, I won't. Well, we have a lot of other issues we want to get to. People are already bringing them up, but I want to uh, kind of continue on this because there's a couple more. Did, sure. Can we go, go like it. speed round a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I'm, right. I'm not good at speed I round. Mean, <laughs> we, I mean, we, we could go all day on this yeah, issue. We I could. Mean, this is the big issue of the day um, yeah. for people housing. Um, but Ben Simon had talked about uh, eminent domain yeah that he feels like the emf building should have been seized by the city by eminent dom dom uh, domain i can't even say it um and that you know things like this going forward that should be the the, yeah. the status and he also feels like the city should stop uh the state from you know doing commercial development at the old courthouse mm -hmm. so we're, so, we're so on those two you know with all due respect to ben you know it's, it's easy to talk about what should happen and even if that those things aren't real, right? So first of all, again, looking at our charter, the city council cannot take a building by eminent domain. The city manager has to take the building by an eminent domain. Um, and you can't, it's not as simple as just saying we're going to take somebody's private property, right? You have to have a legal reason to do it. So we just took a, we took a property at my behest a couple of years ago, Vail Court, those, those on, off of Bishop Allen Drive, those um, boarded up you know, uh, condemned buildings. We took it specifically for affordable housing. Um, and we're still in court two years later because the previous owner is challenging that we don't have a reason to take it. We don't have an affordable housing crisis and therefore we didn't have a right to take the building. So it's not, you don't just say take that building by eminent domain, right? There's a legal, you have to have a legal standard in order to do that. So, so you have supported eminent domain in the past in certain cases? I, I, I mean, we've only had one incident since I've been on the council. There's yep. been one incident where that came up, and that was for these buildings. And those were buildings that had been condemned for over 10 years, and they were boarded up and doing nothing, and the owner was not moving on any kind of project with those buildings. And we're still in right. a legal battle. As, so it's not easy. And it just, costs money, I'm guessing. And it costs a lot of money. And it, it's not easy just to say, take something by eminent domain. Um, in, in terms of the Sullivan Courthouse, the state owns that building, not the city. But couldn't the city say no to the state? Like, you know, this is in our hood and we, no. we don't like what you're doing and we're going to, you know, throw everything down and not <laughs> let you do it? <laughs> not, not, no. I mean, the, and this is, this went to court and people challenged the state's ruling in the court ruled with the state now the the issue is in order for that courthouse that renovation to go forward the developer needs to be rent wants to lease 400 parking spaces from a city-owned parking garage so the question we're going to have to decide is do we lease those spaces or do we not now there's a study going on as to what the impact of that would be and what have you so i'm waiting to see what that study shows but if we say no we're not going to lease those spaces now that developer has a decision to make. They can try to find parking somewhere else. They can sit on the building or they can say, we're gonna back out. But then the state still puts that out to bid to the, to the highest bidder. So, you know, this idea that 
if we deny the parking spaces, we're going to end up with 200 units of affordable housing. It, it, I wish it was that simple. If it was that simple, it'd be a no-brainer. Uh, but it's not that simple. And um, you know, you're still talking about a project that's going to run probably close to $200 million. It's $50 million just to get rid of the asbestos, let alone you know, cutting off floors. and ch So it is, all these things are far more complicated than people make them out to be, and it's not for people's lack of trying to work this stuff out. So, you know, we'll see where the Sullivan Courthouse goes. But Now, uh, we talked about uh, affordable housing, how uh, that number's been increased with, you, you know, some of, some of the things that you've done up to 20% now. Um, one of the issues that Ben has brought up and other people and even myself, you know, I, I actually lived in a limited equity for a while with my mm -hmm. girlfriend in Cambridge, so I know how it works in some cases. You know, I know every contract's a little different, but the issue for a lot of people is that they either make too much money, just a little bit too much money, and they're still poor. They have some, almost no net worth, and they make yeah. just a little too much money, or they are poor enough to qualify for them, but they can't come up with the down, you know, the down payment. Yeah. What do we do about that to yeah. make it affordable for like really everybody? Yeah, that housing is an issue not just for a certain small sliver of people, but a, kind of a larger group yeah. of people now. So this is, I mean, this is such a huge topic, right? And so. You know, when you look in, and you look at Cambridge and you look at the population that we've lost over the last 20 years, our low income population has remained roughly around 16 percent. Right. And those are people who live in public housing or qualify for inclusionary. That middle income, that teacher, people like uh, me, people like you, people like me, I, who make too much money to qualify, yep. but not enough money to pay rent. We've lost over, almost 50 percent of that population in Cambridge. And, and that's like the heart. Those are like the people that have, you know, opportunity, families. Yep. yep. And that's, I just saw a thing in a, in a magazine the other day that had a condo in Cambridge. It was a two bedroom. I want to say it was like twelve or 1,300 square feet, one bathroom on one side of the page. And then on the other side of the page, you had a house in Hingham, which was, you know, more than twice the size square footage, four bedrooms, three baths, both selling for a million dollars. And so, you know, if you're a family, you know, you have your first kid, fine, you can kind of squeeze Swing. in and you have your second kid and you say, gee, I want a yard or I need a bigger place. You can't, you can't touch a place in Cambridge. And that is a problem, a, a huge problem. The bigger issue is, you know, what, what would be, if I said to you right now that when this show is over, there's a great diner in Worcester, I, we should go eat. You would look at me like I was crazy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Worcester's 45 minutes away. Right. In any other part of the country, that would be a suburb of Boston. For sure. To us, it's like you pack a lunch, right? Right. Um, we don't think regionally in this state. We should be investing in high-speed rail to Worcester and Springfield and Holyoke. We should be spreading out the jobs that are in Cambridge and Boston into those communities that were once manufacturing powerhouses, Fall River, New Bedford, Lowell, Lawrence. Um, and we should be investing in public transportation and housing and jobs so that if you could... If you worked in Kendall Square, but you could get in and out, of, you could live in Worcester and get to Boston in 20 minutes on a reliable train, mm -hmm. you don't have to pay three thirty-five hundred dollars a month for an apartment, right? But we don't we don't think that way in Massachusetts, and we need a governor and we need a legislature that really starts thinking regionally about how to solve these but, housing but problems. But with that question I asked about the, you know, the limits and how does that get fixed within Cambridge? I mean, I know those like just to start, there's these nonprofit mm -hmm. orgs that, that oftentimes work with a city. Can that be changed so that we do increase the number of people who, like what you talked about, that middle class? That yeah. Some of the, some of it can, some can't, because just to start, HRI, these affordable housing developers get federal money. And so there are restrictions on who they can rent so to and who the they can't So it's a federal issue. Oh, this is it's, unbelievable. Oh, it's hugely a federal so, issue. So the and the federal are government's acting cutting, like, and they're yeah. cutting all, all kinds of funding. So right. it's like the federal government is acting like uh, Nebraska is, is Cambridge, like the cost is the same too? Like that's well, the other issue. So, that, so it's funny, when you look at the, um, you know, when they look at AMI, which is the, 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 the income level, they Cambridge, Boston, like the region is like Cambridge, Boston, Quincy, Nashua, New Hampshire. Like it's a weird sort of zone that they, the federal government has created. So, you know, it's obviously a lot more expensive to live in Cambridge and Boston than it is even in Quincy, but certainly New Hampshire. Um, but all that gets averaged in together. I see. And so, you know, there are some things that, that we got to change the federal rules. Um, but one thing I, I want to make sure we, we, we get to that we're working on in housing is this affordable housing overlay. And it it's, you know, so city has zoning that goes throughout the city, right, that tells you 
you know, how high a building can be, how dense a building can be, what have you. We're looking at passing what we call a 100% affordable housing overlay district. And that would mean that for three main things, anyone who builds 100% affordable housing, so no luxury, you know, no market rent, 100% affordable, we would give you greater height and greater density to make that project financially viable. That's cool. Right now, it is impossible for affordable housing developers to develop property in certain parts of Cambridge. West Cambridge, 1.3% of the housing in West Cambridge is considered affordable. That is a gated community, right? It is pretty much. And I don't blame the people who live there. They didn't create it, but this goes back to redlining. I mean, it's so funny. It is. It really is. But this goes back to redlining. This goes back to, you know, zoning that was, that was developed that said, we're going to leave, make these areas sort of wealthier and these areas, you know, less wealthy. We have to dismantle that, right? And so this overlay would make it more financially viable for affordable housing developers is, is to West build Cambridge throughout the city. Is West Cambridge resisting that? Is that what you're saying when you brought you West Cambridge? You could say that. I could feel so that. You could I say could that. imagine. There it's are like a number of people. Over yeah. There. there are a number of people who are resisting it, and they don't want, you know, they like what they have, and they don't want it to change. But, you know, if Cambridge is going to live up to being the equitable, diverse community we like to say that we are, then every neighborhood needs to be part of that solution. And that's what this overlay would allow. Um, we have we need six votes to pass it. We have five counselors that have come out more or less in support of it. Um, so we'll see where it goes. But it would make it more financially viable to build affordable housing throughout the city. And that's what we have to do. Awesome. Uh, we have a lot of other issues to get to. We, we, we really did a circle around on housing. I'm glad yeah. we spent some time on it. Yeah. Uh, probably because of Ben Simon, he was focused uh, hey, so much on housing. Yeah, well, I know that he, you know, he has a personal story that you know that was that you know impacted, and you know he was one of the, his family was one of those families that had to leave. So I, I get it. Do you, uh, that's another thing. Do you su- would you or do you uh, support um, rent control? Bringing that back. When you mention rent control to anybody in Cambridge, we all go into like PTSD, <laughs> right? Um, it, you know, the devil's in the details. Rent control, if you were saying to bring back rent control of the 60s and 70s in Cambridge, I would say no. It didn't work. Um, most of the people living in rent control departments, upwards of 90% were people who could afford market rents. So it wasn't even going to the low-income people that really needed it. Um, it depressed the housing market. You had You had landlords who didn't have enough money to keep their property in good shape, right? So a lot of the rent control, the, you know, apartments where people were living in terrible conditions. So I don't want to go back to that. Um, I did form a tenant displacement task force being led by Councillor Sambul Siddiqui to look at how can we create stronger tenant protections to protect people from being evicted, to protect people from outrageous rent increases. So we are looking at that in Cambridge right now. Um, and, you know, we'll see where that goes. But I, I do think we, we do have, we have a crisis. I just met with six single mothers they live in a nine unit building um they're all on section eight and their rent they all have kids in the schools their rent went from sixteen hundred dollars a month to twenty eight hundred dollars a month because their building sold and they came into my office in tears because what were they they're going to pull their kids out of school that many of them i think four of the six grew up in cambridge um now we were able to work with the cambridge housing authority and the new landlord to help them and get them a two-year reprieve um but I had no units for them, you know? And that, I mean, there's nothing worse than sitting across the table. And this is what I say to some of the folks who are saying, we don't need more affordable housing in Go. Cambridge. Um, come to my office, sit right. across the table I from mean, a single whoever mother. Whoever says that is insane. Well, there are a lot of people that I, are. I, I like that uh, you talked about the, the increasing the uh, zoning and, and raising the heights for like 100% we're, affordable housing. We're talking housing. 10 feet. That would be unbelievable. We're talking 10 feet. That would be unbelievable. I, I love that idea. Uh, so we do have to get off housing. Okay. We've spent right. too much time. I'm sorry. On, but I love that. I love that. Uh, I could come back Cambridge every is, week if you want. Maybe. Yeah. maybe. <laughs> well, I love that idea that Cambridge is doing that. That's like huge. Um, and I would love to see that that happen, you know, see some yeah. buildings well, just be 100%. percent we got to convince housing. one more counselor, so right. we'll see what happens. Um, so uh, perfect. Um, cannabis. We want to get to cannabis because sure. we people are obviously talking about cannabis. Um, things have been happening. I haven't been keeping up. I was all over Cambridge Cannabis for a while when I was living there and doing a show there, but now I'm not. Yep. What's going on with Cambridge? So we just passed the, we, we passed zoning to allow adult use cannabis. And you, you might find this, you might find this funny. We, we, we got the, we were going to, uh, we took the vote in February and we needed a couple months to 
for it to be enacted. So I, I had it enacted on 420. 420? <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. I knew you uh, were. It actually ended up being 422 because we had a couple days of a delay, <laughs> but I, sh I, was, I was shooting for 420. I think 420 was on uh, a Saturday this yeah, year. Yeah, too, so, so Monday yeah. We, we, we did it. So um, so we already passed the zoning, and right now what we're, we're, we're what's going through the ordinance committee is dealing more with the licensing issue, the um, economic empowerment applicants, social equity applicants. Um, how do we make sure that we prioritize them? Um, how do we make sure that we support them? So we've we've got a number of things that we're going we're going through. So at this point, even though the zoning is in place, at this point nobody can get a host agreement yet until we pass this more regulatory uh, licensing, which you know I've been encouraging my my colleagues to pass yesterday because you know this this is a new this is a new endeavor for everybody, right? We're not going to get it perfect on on the first try. Um, but I want to. I want it to move out of committee and get passed because we're not helping any of these applicants by waiting. By by, by what waiting. Are, what is the economic empowerment like? What are they so, talking about? What do they want to do? So those are applicants that have been, uh, you know, adversely impacted by sure. the war on drugs. You, you know, minority applicants. Uh, it, it also goes for women applicants. Um, and so what we want to do is, you know, Cambridge is even though we're the fourth largest city in Massachusetts, geographically we're really small. And so right now we have three medical dispensaries with two more on the way. Um, all five of those are going to want to convert over to adult use, either to probably do both, right, medical and adult use. So that's going to probably be five already. So one of the things we're concerned about is we don't want to saturate the market so much with the big guys that the little guys can't, they're going to get pushed out, right? So we, we've, we've tried to, you know, how do we help them? um get established how do we help them it's it's incredibly expensive and incredibly hard for you know anyone even and, people and, with and money even people with money but even certainly people with major money yeah but even you know but certainly those who, who don't, don't have, have major money right so that's kind of what we're kicking around and, and what we're talking about but again you have you have equity applicants um in cambridge right now who are ready to go they've got their license from the state they need a host agreement from the city they're even paying rent yeah. on locations and in the city killer and they can't go forward until we pass this so i keep saying to my colleagues like let's Get go done. we're not helping these people anymore. you are bankrupting people that would yeah you wait. we no need question. To, we need to pass this get it moving see what works but what i, I work. feel like their intentions are good too so it's yeah i can yeah. see both sides of it yeah. um grant smith has a question related sure. to all this uh, he says i have a question for the mayor on cannabis if you're reading the comments mike <laughs> <laughs> mr mayor currently there have been some concerns raised in the globe and elsewhere as to the consolidation of cannabis licenses among a handful of out-of-state companies. Before signing uh, community host agreements, does Cambridge review the companies applying for cannabis licenses with an eye towards preventing that kind of corporate monopoly? Yeah, so the again, this is something the city manager has is the one that signs off on host agreements, not the city council. Um, but yes, when and, and we've only, I mean, so far we've only had to do this with um, medical dispensaries, right? So... You know, we were talking about Healthy, healthy Farms. Healthy Farms, right? yeah. What's so, up with them? Are so they closed now? So, no, I, I, so Healthy Farms in, in Harvard Square, they, you know, they opened as a medical dispensary. They got their permits. They got, you know, all the, the host agreement and, and everything else. Then, and they were open and they were operating, and they have now sold to a larger company. And the city is now saying, we're going to put you on hold because we didn't give the permit to this larger company. The forefront. We gave the, it's the, the forefront. Right. Who's so, that? We, you know, we know the uh, founder, Chris Crane, good guy. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's kind of being worked out. And again, this is you know this is new territory for everybody. Um, one of the things we did in the zoning, so in the medical marijuana zoning, medical cannabis zoning, um, no no dispensary can be within 1,800 feet of each other, right? So that basically controls a little bit of how many we can have. It means we can have about eight medicals in the city if you figure where all the zones are. We eliminated that buffer zone for. Equity, Rec equity, oh, equity applications. Yeah. So good. So they can o they can open within those zones. See, that's what Boston um, needs to do. They have a buffer zone, and and yeah. this is what they're doing. They're pitting people against each other, yeah. especially the low cost, you know, the the lower income equity applicants. Yeah. So we allow them to open. So one of the things we also put in is that that's awesome. But one of the things we put in is that that license, that permit for that equity applicant, is deed restricted. So let's say you have an equity applicant that opens up, and they get the privilege, the you know, the benefit yes. of opening right next to a they medical place. They can't sell off to big. They cannabis. can't sell to a big cannabis. That that permit goes away. That's a good. So move. they could sell to another equity applicant. These, these are uh, interesting moves. Uh, uh, no. This is like a. Uh, this is what every city in town should be looking at. I don't think a lot of them are, but uh, yeah, interesting so that you guys are, because it's. Uh, you wonder if uh, cannabis control commission in, in the state isn't looking at some of these ideas too. 
um, and they'll probably come from a city like Cambridge or Somerville. That's what yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah, so well, these they, are interesting. They, they often do. Are there any other things like that are, that are happening that we should know about, like what you're considering? Around, around cannabis? This? Yeah, so, around so these so licensing issues. We're, we're looking at, you know, can we require um, other dispensaries that are not the equity applicants to uh, carry a percentage of equity applicant product? product? Um, like and so what is that, you know, what's... We, it's kind of touch and go. We can do it, but we can't do it so much that the percentage is so high that someone could claim that we're bankrupting, bankrupting them. them. Yeah. So it's like, how do you, you know, is that 10 percent? Is it 20 yeah. percent? Like, you what know, who knows? Number? You know, we're going to have to try something and, and, and see how it goes. Um, we're looking at it. Can we require um, some of the larger dispensaries to create partnerships with the equity applicants? I mean, most of the focus is really on the social equity and, and economic empowerment applicants. And how do we help the little guys be successful? And that's what we're that's what we're kicking around. Excellent. That's great. Um, a lot of other issues we want to talk about. Some. What do you want to talk about? Because <laughs> we're we're running out of time, and I okay. don't want to leave anything out that you really want to get into. Well, I just um, one thing I want I want to talk about is um, just a couple things that we've done around uh, immigration. Oh, uh, yes. I want to put this plug out. Um, one of the first things I did when I took office was to partner with the Cambridge Community Foundation uh, and start the uh, Cambridge Legal Defense Fund for immigrants. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that immigration cases are civil cases, not criminal. So if you're a low-income per immigrant and you get brought to court by the federal government, you don't get assigned an attorney. See, I didn't realize that. I yeah. should know that. That's yeah. ridiculous. I don't know that. So these are civil cases because I understand that, because that, uh, this is like a topic on Boston Public Radio a lot, actually, about uh, the state possibly starting to offer public assistance. Right. So that's what we're doing. For, for so civil cases because, I mean, I didn't. All, ev almost every immigration case is a civil case? Right. So you, you are in there by yourself. Now, if you can get a pro bono attorney, that's great, but there's just not enough of them, right? Sure. So we started this legal defense fund. We raised in the first year $250,000. We offered four grants to, um, non -pro you know, to, to pro bono non to attorneys that provide, will provide legal assistance to immigrants who live and work in Cambridge. Um, and it was successful, and now Somerville joined us, and now we've partnered with Somerville. So we're starting to spread this out, um, you know, and it's something that, you know. Do you think this is the, something the state should be doing? Uh, Boston does it. Um, I, yeah, I think the state should be doing a lot of Massachusetts? things. Massachusetts? You know, Do you think I mean, Governor Charlie Baker should get on this? <laughs> I, would, I would be very interested in, yes. You know, we, we need to pass the Safe Communities Act. Cambridge has been a sanctuary city since the mid-'80s. Crime is at a 60-year low. We're not being overrun by, you know, Cambridge undocumented immigrants. I mean, it's it, the rhetoric from Mr. Trump is, and I don't call him President Trump until he starts behaving like one, and I'm still waiting. Um, Mr. is even the, too the, much. The, yeah, it is. The, the rhetoric from him is so poisonous and so awful and so unfounded and unsupported. Um, so the, the state needs to move on the Safe Communities Act. I know there's a lot of people working hard on it, but you got a governor who says he's going to veto it, so... Um, you know, we need to do that. We need to make sure we're supporting our immigrants. We've been doing a lot of work in Cambridge um, around uh, when I ran, my whole platform was on social and economic justice. And so we've been doing a lot of work on homelessness. We've been doing a lot of work on we now just passed a started a program where every student in the Cambridge Public Schools from preschool through 12th grade gets free breakfast. Uh, and we expanded our free lunch program because kids can't learn if they're hungry. Um, we're about to launch a college savings account program where the city will make a, a, open a savings account for students in the Cambridge Public Schools to help them save money for college. Um, we've done, uh, you know, I talked about the Tenant Protections Committee. We have an arts, Mayor's Arts Task Force because I know the arts is, and I just want to touch on a few things there. Um, that task force has generated a number of policies from uh, eliminating the permitting fee for buskers. I love that. Right? That's new, to right? It, that's new. We just did it this year. It's so um, funny because I'd, I'd be going to get my uh, parking sticker, right? Yeah. And every once in a while, I'd see some buskers coming up and and be like, what are you guys doing? I'm yeah. Like, what, why are you at this office? And they're like, oh, we got to pay a fee to yep. schedule a time. I'm like, yeah. What? So we, we eliminated the fee, right? We also um, passed a policy L that... Let me make sure people understand, because some people don't know what a busker is. Okay. So uh, street street, per street yeah. performers, street, street artists. People who play on the street, play their guitars in the right. street for you and entertain you. In the past, they had to pay Cambridge a fee to play. Right. And, now they don't. And Somerville and Boston eliminated their fee. Cambridge 
kept their fee. And so we were losing a lot of this revenue. You know, we're not, no, we were losing this talent yeah. because they were like, I'm going to go to Somerville and not have to pay. So we said, forget it. You don't have to pay in Cambridge anymore. We passed a policy that 1% of city construction projects, 1% of the money on city construction projects is going to now go directly to the arts. So the $200 million Tobin School we're going to be building, 1% of that, or $2 million, is going to go directly to, to the arts. Um, where, when you say the arts, because that's where people get skeptical. This is yeah. where people have issues. Where, where do you, where's that money going to go directly? So, so some of that detail still has to be worked out, but it will probably most likely go to – we want to expand grants you know, for artists. We want to um, make sure we're, we're looking at how do we get you know, cheaper, um, you know, lower-cost rehearsal space. Um, we uh, uh, we uh, we passed a policy that a percentage we haven't decided on the percentage yet of the hotel and motel tax as well as the cannabis tax be directly go to art projects in Cambridge. Awesome. Um, we uh, passed a policy allowing businesses and restaurants to not need a permit for acoustic music, so they can just you know they don't have to go through this crazy ridiculous permitting. permitting process they can just have acoustic music anytime that they want um we directed the city to put together a list of organizations and foundations that support the arts so that artists can have can you know help Some them get re revenue streams go. um so this has all been done since february so and this is it, kind of response to what's been going on it, with the emf it, right? it, in response and ben simon's been a part of it he's he's on the arts task force the mayor's arts task force um so i appreciate his work that, that he's done on this but we're trying, you know, and I admit fully that the city dropped the ball with EMF support, with, not just with the EMF building, but we, we should In have been general. doing yeah, we should have been time. doing more to support the arts than we were doing. But when you look at my term as mayor, we're doing more now than we've than, than we've done. So, um, you know, I'm not one for fiery speeches. I'm I'm a person of action. I want to see results, and I have a long list here of things that we're doing for the arts community um, that weren't ever being done before. So I'm proud of that work. Excellent. Uh, we're speaking to uh, Mayor Mark McGovern. He's definitely making the case that so you, you are up for re-election. I want to make, make people, uh, but it's as a city council, right? Right. So you can't, you don't run for mayor exactly. in Cambridge. You elect, we have nine city councilors that are we, all at large. Which you basically, you were elected as a city councilor. Right. And then the nine city councilors elect which one of them will be the mayor. So um, you run for city council and then you have to convince for your colleagues to vote for you. So uh, you'll be running for city council. I'll again. be running for city council. And they're all at large seats, basically, right? right? No, anyone no, can vote for anyone in the yep. city. No districts, no wards. And it's very competitive. It's very competitive. I love it in Cambridge. I think like, we had 27 it. people right. last time. And so. like, like how, how many city councils are there? Nine. nine? And so like- That know, includes the mayor. The so. first nine, obviously, you know, get, a, get into office, but if you look at like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, they're so close to yeah. getting in. It's just like yeah. the margin of victory in Cambridge between not just like you know one or two candidates, but a bunch of candidates. Yeah, it's I mean, very competitive. I think between I think between eight and eleven, so eight, nine, ten, eleven in the last election was something like twelve votes yeah. or fifteen votes. I mean, so it was crazy. It's like you, you and a couple of your friends can decide who's on yeah. this council. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jan Devereaux, who yes. we've had on the show, I love her. She's a supporter of the arts. Her husband's a musician. Um, and she's, yeah, I, I just, she's, I like her on cannabis. She's been so good for mm -hmm. us on our show too. And just some of the issues that we support, but she announced that she's not running for yeah. election. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. Um, so Jan's the vice mayor. Um, so we've been working a lot together this term and I, I'm just, I told this to Jan, so I'm not speaking out of school. You know, Jan and I, when Jan first got on, um, we didn't agree on a lot of things. We had different, we sort of have different backgrounds and, um, you know, we would sort of not, we'd bump heads a little bit, right? Um, but we have grown to find common ground on so many issues. I mean, the work that we've done for bike infrastructure, we, 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 we wrote the first um, ordinance in the country requiring the city to put separated bike lanes in when they do construction projects. And now DC is looking at it. New Yorkers land, Jan, and it's Jan, become a big thing. I mean, be, this is yeah. become and talked about, and it should have been something we were yeah. doing all along. Yeah. So I, you know, I have a ton of respect for Jan, even if we don't agree on every issue. She works hard, she's honest, and she's fair. And that's all I want from a colleague. I, I don't want everyone to agree with me all the time. I'm not right, right all the time. And you know, people pushing me to think differently about things, um, you know, is 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 important. I hope that I push them to think differently about things. 
Um, but all I want is someone who works hard, who cares about the city and, um, you know, who, who, who's fair and, and open to conversation. And Jan is that, and we're, we're going to miss her. We will miss her. Definitely. Um, congratulations to Jan Devereaux for her, uh, was it two terms of service? I believe two, yeah. yeah, she did. She did a really good job. I like her a lot and, uh, we'll definitely miss her in, uh, Cambridge as a Cambridge city councilor. Um, so when is this election? November. If anyone wants to support you, where do, where do they find you on your, uh, Mark uh, is the best way to do it. Um, and, and you also do the social media. I see you on Facebook, especially. Yeah, yeah we do a lot of Facebook. We do, uh, you know, Twitter. Mo- my Twitter account is, I have a personal account, at MarkGov. And then we have a mayor's account, Cambridge underscore mayor. Um, and that's where I, you know, those are separate from, you know, the campaigning stuff and the city stuff, obviously. I don't want anyone to conf- <laughs> confuse those things. Um, but uh, but we're doing, a lot of, we're doing a lot of really good things. I'm really proud of the work we've been doing this term. And uh, we just got to get this overlay over the finish line. And I definitely want to thank you, too, for uh, medical cannabis patients uh, in Cambridge, but also even beyond that, for, you know, in the state. When times were tough and we were just trying to get these places open, you were one of the first people to really help us out and, and you know, not just say you're going to help, but actually do the help, which was, uh, you know, running, you were basically running the campaign for, ca- ca- you know, medical patients in mass. You, you basically. My office wrote the ordinance that eventually got passed with a, with a few tweaks, so. You were there for us, is yeah. what I'm saying, and you helped. Thank you. And I think if you weren't there, I don't think it might have gone forward in Cambridge, and I, which is crazy because we think of Cambridge being so liberal, so many people voted <laughs> for it, but, you know, there's a lot of not in your backyard in uh, Cambridge like anywhere else, and especially when it's an old town and people, yeah. you know. I tell people all the time that we need to live the progressive values we say we have, and it's easy to say you support affordable housing until you want it, until someone wants to build it next to you. Right. It's easy to say, you know, Cambridge voted for adult use cannabis at about 70%, and People are saying, oh, I voted for it. Just put it over there. You're right. Don't you put know? it in West Cambridge. Don't put it next to yeah. me and Kendall, or, you know, wherever you yeah. live. It's yeah. it's no, nope. this is what comes up. And and, uh, and I don't I don't play that game. I mean, if if you know, if it's good for the people, if it's OK for the people in Central Square to have it, it's good for you to have it. In West and Cambridge I saw you having places. these conversations online and in person with some of the, you know, even you know, some of the common people, you know, we don't have to name names, but. You know, and some of them actually came around. Mm-hmm. You know, one I'll say is Patrick, for instance. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so I, he's I not saw totally you know, there yet. We're yeah, working. He's up. not, but you know, he, on, in the medical, he actually kind of. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I, I can't remember the exact situation, but he was, he wasn't as mad as I thought when we when you know he yeah we well, he, won. <laughs> he's he's he, he's a guy that we we go back and forth, but we're friends. We're actually going to the Rolling Stones together, so I'll there work I'll work him over. You work him over. Down he's there. a good guy too. I mean, some people, you know. You can disagree on politics or whatnot, but I, I like Patrick. Yeah. Uh, our phone number, 502-501-3477. We're the Young Jerks. We're here every Saturday. It's starting to get warm in here, Murph, huh? Yeah. Uh, are we time for a break? What time? What do we got for time? 5.50? Five, 5.00. Five, five, oh, yep. five, oh, so we're perfect. All right. So we're going to take a break. And okay. We thank you so much for coming in. All right. My and, pleasure. Uh, Anytime. I, I love being yeah. on the show. And we're going to uh, take the after... You know, after interview picture, so stick it, stay All in right. the seat. Very good. But uh, before we leave, we're gonna uh, we have some other guests coming in. We're gonna have a second panel uh, with Judy. I uh, hope I'm saying this last name right. Newfeld. We'll find out. Uh, she she had an interaction on uh, Facebook with an elected official named Stephen Murphy, and it ended up uh, going on into the Boston Globe. A big column from Yvonne, Yvonne Abraham. Uh, the column is called "Steve Murphy Privilege and." Uh, and pie holes. <laughs> this is the pie hole incident. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so God. we're going to talk to her all about that and get into it. And uh, we're hoping our friend Donna Hackett, uh, she's a medical cannabis patient, we have an award for her from our award show uh, that she couldn't attend. And we're hoping she's going to be here and we'll be able to give, it, give that to her. And we might talk about free cannabis and everything else that's going on. We'll take your phone calls. We'll read your comments. So we'll be back. We're going to take a quick break, maybe five, ten minutes. We'll be back uh, live with our next uh, group of guests. But again, I want to thank you, Mayor thank you. Mark and McGovern, for coming in. My pleasure. Thank you for what you do in Cambridge, and uh, good luck in your election. Thank you. And if you want it, like you said, you want to come back I'll every come week. Come on anytime, man. I, I don't know it. if we can handle each other every week, well, but, but more often, yeah, let's do absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Perfect. All right. Young Jerks, we'll be right back. <laughs> 